So The Turning was a movie and it wasn't a, a very good one. But honestly, I like Floria, the director. She directed The Runaways. That's a great movie. She's directed a bunch of different cool music videos over the years. I like Mackenzie Davis. I like Finn Wolfhard. And apparently a lot of people think this little child actress is fine. But yeah, no, not, not very good. Just not, not very good at all. Now, when I made my overall horror video, I did say I was going to make one specifically about this because there was just like so much going on for a movie that really had nothing going on. So originally this was actually a passion project for Steven Spielberg. And it was originally gonna be called The Haunted. It had a different director, an entirely different cast, but literally two weeks before it was going to start filming, Spielberg pulled the plug because of a massive amount of rewrites that essentially changed what they were trying to make with this movie. I would love to know what this dude came up with, but it was bad enough that they pulled the plug on the entire thing and then delayed it. So as I mentioned in that last video, The Turning is actually based on a horror novella that was written in 1898 by Henry James called The Turn of the Screw. It was released in serial format, as many things were back then, and it's continued to be studied for over a century since it was originally published. So for those of you wondering why it's called The Turning, even though, like, nobody's turning into anything. That's why. The name actually comes from the first page of the novella itself, and the term turn of the screw is talking about how one person told a story that included a child, which just increases the tension or turns the screw. So our narrator of the story is like, oh, well, I have a story that involves two children turning the screw even more. This novel is very ambiguous in terms of what people believe happened. And this resulted in a wide variety of interpretations from different readers in terms of what they think happens, how that changes the entire narrative of the story. And that's one of the main reasons why it's been debated for so long. And at the end of the day, it did what he likely intended. It filled readers with a sense of suspense, fear, and dread. So this story is actually being relayed to people listening to a story by someone who claims to have the manuscript written by this dead governess. She she was hired by a man to take care of his young nephew and niece after the death of their parents. It was mostly supposed to be the girl at first, but then the boy ends up getting expelled and a series of weird things start happening, supernatural things that can't be explained. So this is relatively similar to what we end up seeing in the turning movie, but it just ends up being so much worse because rather than letting it be ambiguous, we just get two endings that still don't feel like endings. The most common complaint about this movie is that it feels highly unfinished. And the Blu-ray version just came out with an alternate ending, which is a little bit closer to the novella. So we'll talk about that at the very end, but it still doesn't feel like it fits because of the lack of setup leading to it in the movie itself. So let's just talk ourselves through the movie itself. So it starts off with this chick running through these creepy mansion grounds. She's being watched by a young girl from a window as she frantically drives towards the gates of the property. When she tries to open the gate, we see the reflection of a man in the window. She screams and it does this thing where it pulls through her eyes until we're in Mackenzie Davis's eyes. Keep in mind, this is shown to us, the viewer, before San Junipero is even on screen. This is something that our protagonist doesn't know, so we have to interpret that it happened unless we want to go down the really weird realm of because it pulled through the eyes, it's all happening in her head, but we'll get to that. Now at this point, I thought this movie was going to be set in the modern age, but it slaps you as a period piece when the television mentions the death of Kurt Cobain. So we're chilling in 1994. But for how much they actually implement the characters listening to music, they don't actually use any music from the 90s. Instead, she actually just hired a bunch of like current artists to write songs that sounded like they could be in the 90s. And she specifically said, you know, she wanted it in the 90s to kind of remove the aspect of modern tech technology. You know, we want to remove the cell phone equation. And she specifically said she wanted to use songs that people didn't know so it wouldn't pull them out of the experience. But if I'm being honest, I was expecting to hear a classic 90s song. So when I didn't recognize anything, I kept pulling out my phone to Shazam every song that played because I thought it was supposed to be from the 90s. And I was like, wow, I don't know what any of this is. So I think honestly, I'm going to have to say that your plan backfired. I'm sorry. You try. It was really good music though. It is really good music. I'll say that. It's fine. So we find out San Junipero here is is a teacher, but she has decided to take on the role of living governess or teacher uh, for this young child who witnessed the death of her parents because her last governess just up and left in the middle of the night. But before she heads out, she stops to visit her mother who is in a full-time mental care facility, most likely with dementia or some kind of schizophrenia. And this is obviously foreshadowing. So she gets to this creepy estate, runs into Mrs. Gross, the housekeeper, who's been with the family for decades. We get some creepy horse jump scares, and then we meet the girl, Flora. So Flora starts to show Kate around and says, oh, that's the East Wing. We don't go in the East Wing. There's a creepy life-size mannequin that's based off of the grandmother. And before bed, the ghost of the dead governess shows up in the window just as she's closing it. Then we get the classic creepy mannequin head turn when no one's around. That's two cliches back to back. 
If I was playing a drinking game, I'd be well on my way to a good time right now. And I would like to point out that the fact that we see this mannequin move its head when Kate's not around to see it really lets us know that they're implying that the ghosts are real. If you show the audience something that no character is witnessing, you're letting the audience know it's real or you're failing at what you're trying to do. And of course there's some weird noises coming from the East Wing and instead of just like, I don't know, listening to the kid and not going down there, she goes to investigate. She hears someone screaming, please help me, please stop and of course she gets locked in the room because that's always what happens but before she can get roped into too much danger stranger things abruptly shows up from boarding school in the middle of the night scares the shit out of her and puts a stop to the haunting probably gonna be in for a real treat with this little shit so the next day she actually comes across like the previous live-in teachers notes about what she was doing with flora and you know how things were going and then as it gets further in it's starting to complain about the fact that this old creep keeps bringing miles to the bar and we find out that this was actually the old stable hand quint who also died recently. But we can't dawdle here because it's breakfast time and Miles' school has called to explain why he's been expelled. It was because he was bashing another student's head off the bathroom tiles. And Kate ends up keeping quiet so they can get off to a really good start, but then Miles pulls this whole sassy, I'm not gonna bring the dishes to the kitchen because that's not my job. And Mrs. Gross is like, they're born into privilege, it would do you good to remember that. So Kate's immediately like, oh yeah, he's a little monster that like brutalized some child and you're lucky that the parents aren't trying to press charges. And then Mrs. Gross will just does not have it. It's not possible. But if it was possible, it's just because the other kids are jealous. Remember, if someone's jealous of you, physically assault them. <laughs> so after that, Miles spends some more time being a little shit, and Kate seems to think he's hiding someone in his room while he's doing his best Kurt Cobain impersonation. Later on at night, they trick her into thinking the little girl fell in the pool, but it's actually just a mannequin, but the mannequin attacks her underwater, so it becomes a ghost -akin. They laugh, she gets pissed, and is horrified. What on earth happened to you? Ask the thoroughbreds. Thoroughbred little shits. So now, of course, she's warming up in a nice bath, and nothing good happens in a horror movie when there's baths involved. Also another cliche. So she opens her eyes underwater, sees something that looks like Miles peering down at her, but she bursts out of the water, and there's just no one there. So at this point, she's terrified, and starts sleeping with the light on and wakes up to Miles caressing her. He starts to ask her if she's afraid of the dark, apologizes for making a bad first impression, and then tries to make a move on her. Children are the pervs, am I right? So she obviously pushes him away and he's like, can I still give you a horse riding lesson tomorrow? And it's during these horse riding lessons that Miles teaches her that if you want to have control over something, you have to break it. And says that Quint's the one that taught him that. And again, really feels like foreshadowing. Creepy assault foreshadowing. And if you think they're gonna do a good job following this up, they're just or not. Then he stomps on a koi fish that a bird was eating, says nothing should have to suffer, and they really like to give him these like cryptic little lines, but they mostly just don't work out well or lead to anything. Kate then has a nightmare that Miles attacks her, then wakes up to Flora standing over her, so she is really not having the most chill time at this point. So Kate tries to smooth things over and proposes that they leave the grounds and go get a new koi fish. So Miles ends up asking his friend in the mirror if he'll keep them safe, and he says yes. So Kate's like, wow, good job, you're actually being helpful for once, and then he immediately ruins it by saying he also thinks your tattoo is sexy the ghost of pervy mcgee is in this boy so she walks by the mirror and then we see the reflection of quint and that's another cliche ghosts in the mirror baby god we should play bingo so they start driving before they even get to the gate flora immediately starts freaking out saying that she's gonna die and it takes kate like way too long to stop the car miles actually has to threaten to kill her for her to stop the car they all get out and then when kate tries to get out miles shuts the door really fast on her again and is like, I know what you're afraid of. Keeping the lights on won't keep you safe. As if that's had any correlation to anything that just happened on screen at all. So she ends up going to get the koi fish herself. She makes good with Flora, apologizes, and she tries to do the same with Miles, and then brings up Quinn, asks if she wants to talk about it because she lost her dad when she was really young, and like, he's just not down for feelings hour. So his continued bad behavior makes Kate go to Mrs. Gross and be like, did Mrs. Jessel leave because of Miles? And that's when she's like, no, it was because of Quint, who is a disgusting animal and tried to take over the house the second their parents died and is probably the reason why Miles is such a little shit. So she again breaks the horror rules and starts snooping around some weird, creepy old rooms, finds some Polaroids of Mrs. Jessel in very compromising positions, and then all the doors just slam shut around her, but then it just cuts that's a way to her reading the journal. It never actually answers what happened, whatever. She's, she's reading the journal. 
But in the journal, Miss Jessel is talking about how Quint is essentially stalking her and she's terrified for her life. Then suddenly there's noises and she's looking out the window and she sees Miles on a horse and then suddenly she's on a horse chasing Miles, but none of this is actually happening. So she wakes up and Mrs. Jessel's like poltergeist dead ghost thing is there just tr like begging her for help. And then she wakes up again in bed. So now she's obviously losing it because she's not sleeping. And when she is, she thinks she's not. And she might even be teleporting. So I'd be exhausted too. And can we get another bingo for a kid painting a creepy picture? We are making our way around this Monopoly board of cliches. So they decide to play flashlight tag and surprise, surprise, we get ghostified again. Something steals the flashlight from her. She assumes it's Miles, but Gross is like, he's been with me the entire time. Even though he's clearly not in this chair. And then Miles looks creeped out for one second. So Kate follows his eyes, sees Quint in the mirror reflection again, and immediately starts accusing him of seeing things positive that Miles must know what she's talking about. So she starts falling apart even more. And then we get idle hands, baby. Be just idle hands crawling all over her ghost hands everywhere. I would just be gone at this point. I don't care that the little girl just came in the room being like, oh, I'll sleep with you. Nah, I'm gone. So the next morning, Mrs. Gross brings her a package that's already been opened and it's from her mother and it's all these crazy all black scratched up pictures. Whatever your mother has, let's hope it's not genetic. I sure hope not, Mrs. Gross. So the phone rings and it's her mom telling her that she thinks they're gonna throw her out of the care facility and she's painted crazy stuff all over the wall, it looks like a woman in water. Then the call suddenly ends and Kate sees wet footprints walking to the window where she sees Miss Jessel outside, runs after her and finds her body in the lake. So now she knows that Miss Jessel is dead. So like, did the mom have a premonition of this? Is that actually her that she drew on the walls? I have no idea. So she runs back to the house, hears noises again. And then this is where the invisible ghost happens, but literally this is replaying the horrible act that happened in this room invisibly until you start hearing the gurgly sound of Jessel being strangled and then you start seeing it happening in ghost form. But then she gets attacked by Ghost Quince and Mrs. Gross walks in on her fighting with nothing. And then she abruptly and immediately comes to the conclusion that Mrs. Gross killed Quint because he knew that Quint killed Jessel. Cause I don't know, police don't exist in 1994. Then in this scuffle, Mrs. Gross gets pushed over the stairs by the ghost of Quince and Ghost Jessel is caressing Flora and Miles is just sitting in his room in a catatonic state. There's so much going on here. So Kate's trying to get them all out of the house but Miles won't go because he says that Quint won't let him leave but very easily manages to get him to go anyways and the three escape. And then, oh you won't, you don't want to know what these what these motherfuckers did, you don't even want to know. It pulls back to a little section on the ripped paper that she's looking at and we are back in the kitchen like this is some kind of choose your own adventure game, except we're just getting every ending. So Kate is ultra sketched out as she's looking at these pictures and she hears Miles and Flora talking about her, talking about how she looks like she's insane. And then Kate pulls a Dumbledore in the Goblet of Fire movie and is like, did you see Clint in the mirror? I know you did. She then breaks Flora's doll by mistake, says she'll fix it. And then Miles hits it with another cryptic line. Can't fix it. She's Broken, just like you. Which I guess could maybe tie back into the, if you want control over something, you have to break it. But again, it doesn't go anywhere after this. Miles kind of makes her flinch and she's just cowering on the ground and things start fading as it did another one of those eye pull throughs from the beginning. And suddenly she's just sitting on a bed in the center of that empty pool area where her mom was at the beginning of the movie. She sees her mom scratching at the same picture she sent her. The mom turns around and then Kate screams. And that's it. That's the movie. There's no real ending. There's nothing tying any of the ideas together. Any story progression is rushed. Okay, so did you catch what the ambiguity is supposed to be? Is Kate crazy or are there really ghosts? Or do we end up in a horrible combination that because of the ghost, Kate ends up crazy. And instead of finding a way to display that ambiguity in a way that leaves it up to the, you know, viewer to decide what's up, it just gives you all of it horribly. Now, this is something you could try to deep analyze. Like I said in my horror video is like the whole pulling through the eyes things, trying to imply that all of this is happening in Kate's head. Like I get the idea that that last shot is her realizing her own biggest fear that like she might become her mom. But we're really not given enough to think on here if that's the intention. Because if it's supposed to be more about Kate, this movie places a strong emphasis 
emphasis on the effects of Quint on Miles. Like obviously Miles is just this toxic ball of pervy rage. He says really messed up stuff to Kate and it's supposed to be the idea that Quint is just an absolute monster of a man that left his influence behind. And those are the real ghosts that linger. Or if we're going in the literal direction, it's actually the spirit of Quint overtaking and influencing Miles. And the director said that stuff with the eyes is supposed to be like the window to the soul. So is Kate seeing her own deepest fear in her head, becoming her mom? That's an interesting interpretation. But again, horrendously executed. So another thing the director said is that the movie is supposed to be about the idea of being locked into the trauma you're dealing with, which is a great idea. I just really don't like the way she did it and don't think that that came through in the story. Like she specifically says she made the ending the way it was to try to redeem Kate from the original story, but what is redeeming about having someone cowering on the floor in fear? It seems like they wanted to make this movie every possible interpretation that anybody has ever had about the turn of the screw, but then just did nothing. Lots to work with in really depressing that it just did not at all come together. But a lot of these discussions end up getting undone with the alternate ending that I mentioned. And I think that the alternate ending might have actually been received better than what we got if they had actually put the work into the movie. Like maybe there's some deleted scenes somewhere that would make this work, but what the alternate ending is is that she's being chased by Quint, who then attacks her. She manages to get the upper hand and starts to choke him to death until it cuts to Flora screaming, you're gonna kill him. And then suddenly it snaps back and it's actually Miles that she's been choking. And now he's dead. And then you get the scene from the trailer that was just completely omitted from the movie where the spider is crawling out of Miles's mouth. And this is supposed to be like, that's the spirit of Quint leaving his body. And then suddenly he's alive because obviously they couldn't kill Finn Wolfhard. These motherfuckers pulling some Harry Potter action. Like that didn't kill Miles, that killed the spirit of Quint. And that itself is a lot closer to the original ending in the novella. And I think this really could have worked. I think probably would have paired really well with the story thread where Kate realizes that Quint killed Jessel when she tried to leave and then gets killed himself, trapping the spirits to the grounds. Obviously there's a lot of stuff going on here, like seeing the ghost assault later on, but you know, there's a way for this to work. And I'm fine with movies with ambiguous endings. I don't think that's the issue here. Like I just finished rewatching Enemy not long ago and Denis Villeneuve. This just doesn't present things in a way that feels ambiguous. It literally just feels unfinished. And it can't even be taken as an unreliable narrator story because we see too much happening outside of Kate's perspective. So yeah, that was The Turning. So much to talk about with so little actually going on. If you're looking for a fun isolation horror movie with two kids, some seemingly supernatural things going on and a lot of mental deterioration, check out The Lodge. I really love that it commits to its ending, which a lot of movies don't have the courage to do. So that's gonna do it for today's video. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm assuming when this goes out, I'm gonna be getting like really close to 100,000 subscribers. So I just wanna preemptively thank you all so much for that. I hope you all enjoyed. Have a fantastic day and we'll catch you all later.